Uh, tonight, I'm delighted to be able to welcome back P.J. Leash from Entomology. Uh, he was born in Racine, Wisconsin, and graduated from Case High School there. Case High School is named for? J.I. Case. J.I. Case. And whose daughter was? <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> just in case. Wasn't just in case. <laughs> so what was uh, what was the governor's name? With the governor of uh, uh, La Follette, wasn't his wife Case before she was married? Just in case, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, then he went to UW Parkside, which is the university that was built at Petrified Springs, which is where he used to go for the Schulte family reunion all through the 60s and the early 70s. And then he came here to get a master's degree in entomology. And uh, some of you know that he started at the diagnostic clinic but if you're like me, you're a little surprised that it was March 1st of 2014. It's already four years ago, four and a half, so this is great. Uh, he's gonna talk to us tonight about the buzz report, the year so far in Wisconsin insects. They seem to be doing pretty good by me. <laughs> uh, but it's gonna be fun to see what the interlopers are and what's new and some golden oldies. Um, I'm a plant pathologist and we don't get to collect things the way that bug people do, like Dan does last year and last week and PJ does this week. Um, plus you get to stick the thing you're working on. <laughs> Is that satisfying? A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming PJ Leash back to Wednesday Night Live. Pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, I will admit, Tom, that when I was in high school, I did have an interest in mycology and plant pathology and that sort of thing, but I would try collecting mushrooms that I'd find in the woods, and I'd put them in a box, and I'd look a week later, and they were either shriveled up or covered with other mold, and you just couldn't collect them very well. So I moved on to insects, and I haven't looked back, uh, looked back ever since. So the cool thing about insects, uh, worldwide there's over a million known species in Wisconsin, the Midwest region, we've got about oh, 20 to 25,000 different species, so there's never a dull moment. Every year is different, uh, subtle differences to the next, one year to the next. So we'll talk about some of that. We will see some things that you tend to see every year, certain times just like clockwork, Japanese beetles pop out and things like that. So we'll talk about some of those. There's always something interesting showing up. Could be new invasive species. I do see about two to three new non-native invasive species show up in the state every year of insects. Uh, and then just some other interesting patterns we're going to talk about uh, along the way. So if you aren't familiar with the diagnostic lab, just a quick rundown of, of what it is. The lab itself was started in the 1970s, um, and it was managed for 36 years by my predecessor, Phil Pelletieri, right here. Uh, many of you probably know Phil or, or know him, his name from his uh, many years on public radio, who was actually on there earlier today as well on the Larry Miller Show. Um, and what the lab does in a nutshell, we identify arthropods. Arthropods are insects and related things like spiders. I mostly deal with insects, but I do get requests to identify spiders and millipedes and centipedes and sometimes even earthworms like jumping worms, if you've heard of those, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later on. Um, and if need be, if it's a pest, I can provide some management recommendations as well. So in a nutshell, I get paid to identify bugs. Now, if I were a 10-year-old kid and you told me I was gonna get paid to identify bugs, I probably wouldn't have believed you. I mean, it really is kind of a dream job. I get to live vicariously a little bit through my cases. I'll talk about that with some of the international cases in a, a couple of slides, but I get to see a lot of really cool insects. And for a geeky entomologist, it's fun to see some of these things. So what does the lab do? We provide assistance uh, a lot for the general public, but also the UW Extension, Cooperative Extension uh, system in the state. Uh, I provide support for county colleagues and county offices. 
I also get samples from the agricultural sector, so farmers and crop consultants, the green industry, so lawn care and tree care and arborists, and um, the greenhouse industry and things like that. If they need arthropod pests identified, I, I interact with them a lot. As well, the pest control industry, I sometimes get some really unusual, uh, really interesting cases uh, from the medical field. Um, whenever I get consulted uh, by a, a dermatologist or a physician, those are usually some rather interesting cases. And then I help identify specimens for colleagues here at UW or other UW campuses or uh, government agencies, DNR, Department of Agriculture, sometimes the feds, USDA, APHIS, if we get a new insect in, I might be consulted. So with that said, I'm kind of the end of the road. Folks in the state come to me to get things identified. So this is kind of the motto around my lab. You know, this is, this is the end of the line to get things uh, identified. Uh, that is an actual sign in my lab, by the way. And just as an example, why do diagnostics matter? Why identify an insect? So I'll show you, and, and here's a good example of it. So in real life, both of these insects are the same size. They're about, well, touch under a quarter inch long. Chestnut, reddish brown. One of these is the bed bug. One of them is not. You can find both of them in the state. We do bump into both of them in the state. One is a parasite of bats. And if you misidentify them, you can end up using a lot of money to try and get rid of the wrong pest. So does anyone know which one of these is the bed bug and which one is the bat bug? The right, the bed bugs, the bed bugs. That's correct. The right one is the bed bug. The way to tell them apart um, on this kind of neck region, if you will, the pronotum, uh, these longer hairs here, those are very indicative and, and diagnostic for the bat bug. But you can't see those with the naked eye. So again, if you find something like this in your house and you see this and you assume it's a bed bug, you could end up paying $1,500 or $2,000 to have your house treated for bed bugs. It's not going to get rid of the problem. The problem in this case, you've got bats up in your attic that you've got to evict when it's uh, appropriate to do so and maybe do some other things. But again, if you don't make that distinction and get it properly identified, you can throw a lot of money down the, the drain. So I deal with cases like that on an everyday basis. And just to show you what the lab is like um, during the winter and, and early spring months, that's when I am tied down doing a lot of teaching on campus. I have a 25% teaching appointment with the Farm and Industry Short Course Program. And then once spring gets really into full gear about May, um, my caseload per month definitely picks up. Um, and then by about Memorial Day, right around the time the mosquitoes pop out, I'm in full what I call summer mode, where it's about 400 or so cases uh, per month. So that could be um, pictures or physical specimens coming to me uh, in the mail. Um, so this far I've uh, handled almost 1,500 samples. Uh, I haven't logged in my database cases for August, so I'm really probably closer to about 1,800 and the vast majority of these are from Wisconsin. So this lab is really providing a service to residents of the state. And just to give you an example of what my entire year looks like, I get a pretty good bell curve. Um, this is my uh, data from last year. I handled over 2,500 samples from uh, mostly around Wisconsin, again, about 95% from the state. Um, and just to show you, you know, where I'm getting from uh, these samples from, I really am interacting with pretty much every corner of the state out there. So this is the data thus far uh, in 2018, color-coded map. Um, if a county is pink, I haven't had any samples from it, but as you can see, everything is a shade of blue. So I have had at least one sample uh, from every single county in Wisconsin. Dane County, I always get the most uh, uh, from Dane County just because I've got an open door policy. My door on campus is open if I'm in, and folks just stop in and say, I found this in my basement. What is it? And so it's, it's pretty fun to see that. But I do get samples really from around the state. Um, and as I mentioned before, I get to live a little bit vicariously through my samples. I do get random emails or phone calls out of the blue from someone in California or Florida or Texas. And so in 2018 this far, I have had samples from about 20 or so um, other states and the District of Columbia, and as the year goes on, that will uh, fill in even more. I think last year I had samples from about 37 different states out there. So it's kind of cool to see some of that stuff. Of course, um, you know, surrounding states in the Midwest, we're going to have very similar insects, but you go to California or Texas or Washington State or Florida, and there are some unusual things that we don't have around here. And then every once in a while, out of the blue, um, I get cases uh, that come from international locations. This is about 1% or, or less of my actual caseload, um, but these are the really cool ones. Things from uh, 
Mexico or Argentina or Brazil. Um, so far in 2018, I've had uh, cases from 10 different international countries, uh, including Libya, which is not a place I expected to get an insect ID request from, but about two or three weeks ago, I had an insect ID request come in from Libya. I'll show you a picture of that in a couple of slides. But I do get to see some really cool insects that otherwise I would not see um, just because I don't have uh, uh, the capability to travel to these places. So cool moths and butterflies from places like Borneo. Um, here's an interesting case, just as an example, uh, a case of weevils from Saudi Arabia. So this is actually an email I had found in my spam folder. And it was just, you know, had a vague title on it and it started like this. Dear sir or madam, I hope that you're doing well. I'm Ghulam Astufa from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I'm ready to seek your assistance. At this point, I'm thinking I'm supposed to mail a check somewhere <laughs> and I'll get a couple million back eventually. Um, but then it goes on. I'm employed by this company, uh, you know, big food company in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, We're facing a pasta infestation in our products. I went to this unusual looking website and download a video clip and, and scan it for viruses and things like that. And sure enough, it was legit. Um, they had some products that customers bought. It was a pasta product. They poured it into a pot of water and found some teeny tiny little beetles in there. And it turns out um, there's a group, the genus Cetophilus, some of our maize and granary weevils, which are distributed around the globe just due to human trade. So they can be very, very common. So um, you can also find these in your own kitchen, but uh, this company in Saudi Arabia was dealing with these uh, as well. And it's just kind of neat to think about with modern technology, digital phones, smartphones, things like this, you know, a hundred years ago, this might have taken months to figure out, to get in touch with someone in Madison, Wisconsin, and this entire exchange took about maybe 12 hours or so. Um, so that's really a, kind of a neat thing to show off when you think about what diagnostics can mean today. And, and by the way, folks have actually studied uh, different types of uh, packaging material just to see which ones are more uh, resistant to some of these insects because places like Italy, you know, they make a lot of pasta and that can be pretty important to them. Uh, and then here's probably my favorite international case I've had recently. This is the one from Libya. So again, I just got an email out of the blue. We're located in, in Libya. We found this. They thought it was some other biting fly that can be associated with certain diseases. Uh, and it wasn't. It's a type of, of louse fly. If you've heard of something called a sheep cat, it's related to those. It's a fly in the family Hippoboscidae. They're weird parasites that basically hang out on... Uh, on the bodies of birds or mammals, things like that. So this is just a glimpse into some of the cool things that I get to see. Uh, and just to show you, uh, as Tom said, I've been around in the diagnostic lab since March of 2014, and this is the map I've been coloring it in, and I'll keep doing this throughout my career when I get cases from uh, different countries. So if we're playing the board game Risk, I'd be doing okay at the moment. I'm starting to fill in the board uh, pretty well. Um, and just to give you a glimpse of, of what type of samples I deal with, um, the vast majority of my cases, about 60%, are actually digital images. Now, if you spoke with my predecessor, Phil Pelletieri, uh, especially about 10, 15 years ago or further back in time, it was almost exclusively physical specimens. When the smartphone came about and digital cameras came about, that changed the game dramatically. I mean, every person in here probably has a smartphone, and if you do, you have an eight megapixel or 16 megapixel camera with it. So it's very easy to snap a picture of an insect, shoot it off in an email to me um, from that same device. And so that has really changed the game a lot. I do still get a, a good chunk of physical specimens. Uh, and in some cases, uh, just from the description alone, it's like playing 20 questions over the phone, except I'm trying to identify an insect. But uh, at the end of the year, it's about 10 or so percent uh, of my cases just from a description. I can figure out pretty well uh, what it is. And again, to show you where the cases come from, I mentioned these groups earlier, uh, homeowners and extension agents. Those are the two biggest chunks of the pie. Uh, homeowners and the general public by far, though, that's the biggest group that I interact with, and that is the group that submits the most samples to me. I get smaller chunks of the pie from the pest control industry and pest control professionals, uh, medical or public health groups, the green industry, so again, the lawn care, tree care, greenhouse industry, uh, farmers, growers, and agriculture, things like that. And then that other group 
that is uh, colleagues at UW, government agencies like the DNR, Department of Ag, USDA APHIS, and groups like that. So that's a breakdown of where my samples come from. So that's a, a quick survey of what the lab is, what it does. Let's take a look at some of the insects, just starting um, with uh, kind of a progression of the calendar in 2018. So we think of winter, hanging out, you know, maybe sitting around the fireplace, um, having a, a fire, of course. And anytime you're bringing firewood indoors, um, January and February, I get lots of cases and reports of these various insects. These are simply what I would call firewood insects because they're associated with firewood. Well, where do we get our firewood from? It's typically the dead, dying, decaying trees out in the woods. There's a lot of insects present in that wood, but the trees get cut down. We bring the firewood inside. Now, if we're burning up that wood right away, we probably don't notice these insects. Where we bump into these is you don't have a fire that often. You bring in a big load of firewood, you have a fire maybe once a month. It mostly just sits there. Well, the insects in the wood are thinking, it's spring, it's 70 degrees in here. Let's come out and party. And then they uh, emerge and you're scratching your head trying to figure out where they came from. So it's things like carpenter ants, um, wood wasps, which if you were to see these from the side, they're basically the bobbleheads of the insect world. They've got this skinny little neck region and a big bulbous head on top. There's a wide range of very cool longhorn beetles, family serumbicity that will emerge from firewood. And then little tiny things like bark beetles that are only about two or three millimeters long. This species in particular, the eastern ash bark beetle, I've started seeing more and more. The reason for that, we've got emerald ash borer um, wreaking havoc in the Midwest. We've got lots of dead and dying ash trees. Folks are cutting those up for firewood, and so they bring it indoors. And if these insects are in there, all of a sudden you get a hundred teeny tiny little beetles that come out, and you're trying to figure out where they came from. The easy solution in any of these cases, though, just move the firewood back outside to a colder spot. And they go back dormant again, and that puts an end to the problem. Also along these lines, I get some reports during the winter months of our native roaches, our wood roaches, the genus Parcoblata. So on the entire planet, there are about 4,000 or so species of cockroaches. Most of them are good beneficial creatures. They are helping break down and recycle decaying plant material, so fallen leaves and rotting fruit and things like that. There's probably a dozen or two species that give the rest of the roaches a bad rap, species like the German roach and things like that. There's this one species or one group that shows up indoors on occasion in association with firewood. These are our native roaches. If you were to go up to a place like Devil's Lake State Park or the Baraboo Hills, and start kicking open a rotting uh, stump or a log, you would encounter, uh, most likely, these native roaches. That's where they live, in moist, rotting wood. When they come indoors, it's really a dead end for them. They won't be able to survive indoors. It's simply too dry. What happens, though, is folks will get these in their house. They panic. Oh, no, it's a cockroach. You know, the end of the world is coming. Um, not really. I mean, they, again, they can't survive indoors. Once you figure out, yes, they most likely came from the firewood, we move the firewood back out to a colder location, and it takes care of the problem for us. But every um, spring and, and during the winter months, I get a bunch of reports of wood roaches indoors. Another thing that pops up during the winter months, citronella ants. And these are ants that live pretty far below ground, often a couple feet below ground, and they raise aphids. As, a, as basically a food source, they get this sugary honeydew source from the aphids. Um, what happens though is these can sometimes be in the soil around or under your foundation of your house. And so the heat seeps into the ground during the winter months. These ants think it's spring or summertime, so all of a sudden you get this massive merge of swarming winged ants inside your house. Um, it's really a dead end for them though. They aren't able to build a nest in your house. They need to be below ground where they've got those aphids that they live with. Um, and so it tends to be a very uh, ephemeral phenomenon. We get a mass emergence of ants. You typically vacuum them up and uh, they'll just disappear on their own within a few days anyways. This is an interesting uh, example of ants though in one of these cases where I can chat with folks over the phone and pretty reliably figure out what it is. The reason they get their name citronella ants, if you were to take one of these and smush it with your fingers and then smell it, it has a very distinct citronella lemony scent to it. So I'll be talking to folks over the phone, say, trust me, but squish some of these ants and tell me what they smell like. If it smells like lemon, we know we're, we're dealing with citronella ant because occasionally we get other ants that pop out during the winter months, carpenter ants and, and a few other things. 
Some other weird insects that uh, show up during the winter months, and I had a lot of reports of these this last year, uh, a species of cutworm called the winter cutworm. Now, typically, if I'm thinking of cutworms, I'm thinking of garden-type situations, chewing on vegetables and things like that. There's one weird species that we call the winter cutworm because it can be active at rather low temperatures. Sometimes it's even spotted out walking on the snow. Um, but it also has the habit as the caterpillar stage of sneaking indoors into buildings. And so you go down into your basement and you spot dozens of these big plump cutworm caterpillars. That's not typical behavior of what you would think of for cutworms, but we do have this one unique species that happens to do that. During the summer months, they can be very common. So this time of the year, if you're looking at your porch lights for moths like I tend to do, um, they have kind of a mottled brown color, but the hind wings are a distinct yellow. We call them the yellow cutworm. It's a very common species that's out there. Uh, but I had a lot of reports this past uh, winter, especially January, uh, February months, of folks finding these big two-inch long cutworm caterpillars in their basement or in crawl spaces, things like that. And another caterpillar that I had reported, and I wasn't aware that this one could be active at low temperatures, but this report came to me right around the time of New Year's when it was pretty cold. Someone had gone out, this was in the northern part of the state, to grab mail out of their mailbox, and they saw a bunch of these caterpillars wandering along the side of the road on the snow. It's a common uh, species we call the Virginia tanuka moth. We've probably seen these outdoors at some point, black wings, metallic turquoise body with a little bit of orange up on the head. Uh, it's a very common moth species, but every once in a while, the uh, caterpillars can be active during some very, very cold parts of the year. And then also during the winter months, I get a lot of report of activity of what we call our fall invaders. So these are insects that are outdoors um, during the summer and fall months, but as the temperatures get colder, as we approach winter, um, they follow some cues and their instinct is to get indoors, find a sheltered place to hunker down for the winter months. Outdoors, they would find a, a cliff face, a rock pile, a rotting log. But if you think about homes and other structures, there's all kinds of little nooks and crannies that they can sneak in through. Um, and so a lot of these insects like to make our home their home for the winter months as well. In the northern part of the state, I had lots of reports um, in 2018 of cluster flies, which are actually a parasite of earthworms, and uh, multicolored Asian lady beetles. We do have this species in the southern part of the state, but it's been relatively quiet the last couple years. Northern Wisconsin has had some major uh, reports of activity up there. In the southern part of the state, though, and in many other parts of the state in the Midwest, box elder bugs um, are probably the top uh, insect that we see getting indoors at the moment, although that may be changing, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. There's also another unusual creature that uh, occasionally shows up during the winter months. It's also a fall invader, so it likes to sneak in from outside. This one is called the Western Conifer Seed Bug. Uh, and they feed on the seed cones of conifers, so pines and spruces and firs and things like that. They really don't cause much, if any, damage to the plants themselves, um, but they sneak indoors, typically in low numbers. You might get two, three, maybe a, a handful of them or something like that. Uh, and they're really pretty harmless to people. They move around rather lethargically. They're pretty easy to catch and, and dispose of that way. And so that's that insect over there. There's another insect out here called the kissing bug. Has anyone heard of the kissing bug, by the way? A couple folks. So there's a couple news articles out there, and every once in a while they get recirculated on the news, or a new news article comes out. And so I get this flood of emails, uh, people claiming I found a kissing bug in my house. And when it comes to kissing bugs, they can transmit a disease called Chagas disease, which is a fairly serious medical condition. You don't want Chagas disease. But these kissing bugs, you really have to be in places like Texas or Mexico. We've never found them in Wisconsin, ever. Um, and so every winter, uh, I get a, a batch of uh, emails and, and worried uh, phone calls. I think I found kissing bugs in my house. In every single case, it's basically this insect or a closely related species. The way to tell them apart or at least identify this particular insect, it's got these white uh, figure four lightning bolt patterns on uh, the middle of the back, and then uh, the legs here. It's like they're stuck in the 1970s wearing bell-bottom pants. So pretty easy to identify, um, but again, diagnostics are important um, because we've never ever had a kissing bug found in Wisconsin, but these things are uh, really common. You could probably find them in just about any house in the state. 
Another thing along those lines that also pops up, although this can pop up any time of the year, but it does get mistaken for kissing bugs on occasion, is something called a masked hunter bug. They are from the assassin bug family, which the kissing bugs are also from. Uh, the adult looks like this. They're entirely black, so they don't have any red on the body like kissing bugs do. Um, and they're good-sized insects, pushing about an inch long or so. Um, and they're beneficial predators of other insects around the house. What's interesting and, and cool about another life stage of this species, though, the juveniles uh, mask themselves, camouflage themselves with bit of lint and debris and things like that. And so that's what this insect is right there. And so you'll get these um, emails or, or pictures, uh, folks basically thinking they found a walking dust bunny in the house. <laughs> and it would basically be this insect right here. Um, it's just a juvenile stage. And eventually they, they toss the camouflage aside. Um, but both life stages are really pretty harmless to people. You do bump into them indoors on occasion. But again, they're feeding on um, other insects around the house. So functionally speaking, they're pretty similar to a spider in that regard that's feeding on other insects in your house. So really not going to mess with you, but uh, they do pop up from time to time. And then this insect. And there's some groans in the audience. So um, if you live in Madison, I suspect you've probably encountered this insect. I said box elder bugs are probably our top fall invader pest. Over time, this one might uh, um, kind of surpass that one on the list. This is a non-native species. It's been in the state for a few years. Um, and with brown marmory stink bugs, the, uh, the little story I like to tell, it's almost like we're in a bad science fiction movie. And someone hybridized Japanese beetles with box elder bugs. And you got this horrible insect right here. Uh, I don't know if this insect has any fans out there. So like Japanese beetle, they feed on hundreds of different types of plants. And like box elder bugs, they like to sneak into your house in the fall. So no one really cares for these insects. They're causing a lot of headaches for farmers and vineyard managers and orchard managers and things like that. They'll feed on ornamental plants uh, as well and garden veggies and things like that. Uh, and then they like to sneak indoors and spend the winter with you. So how do we identify these? There are some native look-alike species. Well, first of all, the classic shield shape to the body, that tells us it's a stink bug. Brown marmorated stink bug also has a checkerboard pattern, this alternating light and dark squares along the back end of the abdomen. Although some of our native brown stink bugs look similar and have a similar pattern. The distinguishing features of this insect would be on the antennae. The antennae are brown with two distinct pale bands. And our native brown stink bugs will only have one pale band, or they'll have some red or other color patterns on the antennae. So that's the main thing I look at. Another clue, which probably isn't going to work all the time, but it works in the vast majority of cases, brown marmorated stink bug consistently seems to be above a half inch long. Many of our <coughs> native stink bugs are a little bit under a half inch long, so that size can be an important clue. But if you're seeing these uh, during the winter months indoors, you know, it's going to be this stink bug species. Our other stink bugs just don't like to get indoors, or they do so very, very rarely, whereas this species will readily come indoors. So let's look at the history of this one. Um, by the way, it originally came from parts of Asia, got into the eastern U.S. in the 1990s, um, and it showed up in Wisconsin in 2010. And then things were eerily quiet for about five years. We would get one, maybe two reports a year. We couldn't really figure out what they're doing. We didn't know were they able to survive our winters, what were they feeding on, and, and so on. Um, things changed in about 2015. In that year, we got about three dozen or so cases in the state. In 2016, we had reports of juveniles. Um, I actually spotted juveniles about a couple blocks away, three blocks away, Allen Centennial Gardens feeding on a dogwood bush. We had uh, adults mating there as well, so we knew they're reproducing in the state. We figured out they can survive the winter because they're in sheltered locations. And so in that year, we had over 50 reports. At that point, we stopped keeping track on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, fast forward to today, 27, uh, 2017 and 2018, they're really pretty locally common in some parts of the state. And Dane County really seems to be the hot spot of brown marmorated stink bug activity in the entire state. So really, Dane County down to Janesville and Beloit is one um, area or zone of very heavy activity. Southeastern Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Waukesha, Racine is another spot. And then the Fox River Valley, uh, Fond du Lac up through Oshkosh to Appleton, and then all the way to Green Bay, that's a third hot spot in the state. So we're seeing this slow spread outwards from there. So um, makes me a little nervous what things are going to look like if we could fast forward five or ten years from now. Again, we'll probably have a lot, uh, lot more of these insects around 
just based on what we're seeing the first few years. And uh, just to show you how common they have become in places like uh, Madison, this was me a couple months back just going to the grocery store. And you pull an item off the shelf, and sure enough, there's a brown marmorated stink bug right there. So they're really getting to be uh, extremely common. And then just to show you some of the other interesting things I get to see around the diagnostic lab, um, during the winter months, folks might have seen these at grocery stores and pharmacies and things like that. And I remember seeing them, and this is a hyacinth uh, plant. And when they were selling them at the grocery store, when I saw them, there's a little vase pre-filled with water with the bulb, and then it was sealed on top with plastic. Now, the big question is, and I still haven't figured this out, where did these originate? Was it the southern U.S.? Was it, uh, you know, another continent, perhaps? I suspect the uh, southern U.S., knowing the, the big greenhouse industry down there. Um, but an individual in southeastern Wisconsin contacted me back in about March, and he said, I think I have some insects in here. They look like mosquito larvae. And uh, sure enough, he brought them into me. They ended up being larvae of a non-native um, mosquito species, Aedes japonicus, um, which is originally from Asia, the Asian rock pool mosquito. It's actually been in the state for about 10 years or so, and it's been established for a while. So in the grand scheme of things, it's something that's already here. But uh, it just goes to show that human activity can move some of these insects around very, very well. So this was in southeastern Wisconsin. You know, we don't know, did some of these get up to the northern part of the state where we don't see that particular mosquito species, or where else did they get moved around the country? So, and uh, by the way, I do have a blog on my website. When I get cool cases like this, I do tend to uh, you know, write up a little story about them. So if you'd like to learn more, check out my website. Um, I've got lots more information and more cool stories out there as well. All right, so when spring gets here, you know, we're all happy to go outside. Things are greening up, lots of insects um, that we all like to go out and, and look at, or at least I do. Um, and for me, spring often means bees. This is a location on campus. If you take the switch back down Observatory Hill, that's where we're talking about. Lots of uh, uh, ground nesting solitary bees right there. You can see all the little things moving around in the screen. There's basically tens of thousands of bees right there, and this is really a common sight. I get a lot of reports this time of the year, and they're just cute. Um, and because they're solitary nesters, meaning that each female has her own nest, they're very docile and non-aggressive. You can literally get within inches of them to take pictures, and they won't go and try to sting you or anything like that. So spring is a, a period of high bee activity. A lot of different species in the state. We actually have about 400 or so species of native wild bees in Wisconsin. And we've got uh, a few social bees like our bumblebees and uh, honeybee, which technically isn't native. But lots of bees out there uh, becoming active in the spring, spring months. And then um, just to give you an idea of how things are changing over time. So this is an insect called the carpenter bee. Um, much more common if you go a couple hundred miles to the south of us, places like Kentucky and Tennessee and Illinois, very common during the spring months. They get the name of carpenter bee because they actually drill into wood to make their nests. They drill in, they make a 90 degree turn, and then they make these long tunnels. And basically the female provisions each of these cells with enough pollen and nectar for her young uh, or larva to live off of, uh, and then she seals up the nest or leaves the, the nest there. Um, I've been watching over the last couple of years, these insects have been moving into southeastern Wisconsin, even here in Dane County. 50 or 100 years ago, we probably would have never seen such things, but it gives you an idea of how things are changing with climate uh, change. We may see more insects like this moving into Wisconsin. So the last two years in particular, I've noticed an uptick of these. Well, if you think back to our winters the last few years, they've been relatively mild. We had a really bad winter, that winter of 2013 and 2014, but then we had a couple of pretty wimpy winters there as well. So I think it helped the increase the survival of species like this. So it's interesting to watch how species change and move into the state over time. And along those lines, um, another insect we don't see commonly in the state, but termites. We have our eastern subterranean termite, which is really pretty rare. It doesn't seem to occur out in nature. We see it infest individual buildings where someone has brought in infested construction material or maybe a couple of, of nearby buildings. There are cities in the state with some known pockets of, of infestation. Places like La Crosse and, and Janesville and Beloit and Oshkosh and Sheboygan have uh, had some issues for really years, uh, but I do get some new spots on the map every year. And in particular, this year, in very short succession, I had not one but two reports just from the west side of Madison alone. Um, so these insects are moving in with milder winters, perhaps that's helping them survive or, or at least give them a leg up um, so it makes it a little bit easier to hang on. 
So I'll be really curious to see how that changes over time. And then a non-insect creature that I'll mention here briefly. Who's heard of jumping worms, by the way? Great. Um, I'm great to see that many hands go up. So um, as an entomologist, I do handle some other creepy crawly questions like slugs and earthworms and things like that. There's a non-native uh, invasive species of earthworm from Asia called the jumping worm. Uh, the reason it's so bad, it basically uh, destroys the soil profile. It consumes all the organic matter in the soil. The soil gets the consistency of dried coffee grounds. And you have plants growing in it. You try to water the plants, the water just percolates through. And so it's like the plants are experiencing a drought. Um, the bad news about these is that once you get them in an area, there's basically nothing you can do to get rid of them. There's no pesticides registered by the EPA to treat earthworms because our other earthworms are considered beneficial because they're mixing in nutrients and getting oxygen into the soil and things like that. So the story with these is they first showed up in the state, in Madison, at the Arboretum, we detect them in 2013, they have been moved around extremely rapidly. So we went from 2013, basically Dane County and, and area over in Waukesha County, those are the dark uh, blue counties down here. Um, and as of last year, we are at uh, about 40 or so counties. So these worms have been moved very, very quickly, <coughs> primarily due to human movement of plants, potted plants, mulch, bark chips, things like that. The worms are getting moved around. I do actually need to update this map because just this afternoon, we had our first confirmed report from Door County. So again, these things are getting moved around very, very quickly. So to go from just Dane County and Waukesha County area to 40 plus counties in the span of about four years, that's a very, very dramatic and alarming trend to see. Um, so this, unfortunately, is only going to get worse over time. There is research being done out there in terms of what folks can do about it to try and mitigate the impacts of this worm. And then spring is also a good time for uh, the four-line plant bug. And this seemed to be a good year for this particular insect. Lots of reports out there. This is an insect very common in uh, late spring and really into the early summer. Very easy to identify. They're about a quarter inch long with these distinct black and yellow stripes on the body, a little bit of orangish red on the head. And they're very fond of feeding on plants in your garden like flowers and herbs, oregano, basil, mint, and things like that. And when they feed, they have mouth parts kind of like a mosquito, this long tube. They stick it into the plant and they actually end up injecting a toxic substance that leads to localized necrosis or tissue death. And so you get these brownish spots on the plant. Now, if you aren't familiar with this insect, you might look at that and think your plant has some type of fungal disease or bacterial disease. It's actually insect feeding. So lots of reports this year in the state. Um, and this is an insect you can find basically statewide from down here in the southern part all the way up into uh, the northern reaches of the state as well. So good year for the four-line plant bugs. It was a relatively poor year for a gypsy moth. So if you were a gypsy moth caterpillar, you probably didn't have a, a very good year and survival was limited. Um, the main story with gypsy moth is whenever we have a rainy year, and this year it was extremely rainy um, in months like May and June, there is a fungal disease, Entomophaga myomyga, that kicks in and the caterpillars basically come down ill with a bad case of the flu and they die because of it. Um, it. That particular fungus has been so effective the last few years, the DNR is basically ending their spray program in the state because we haven't had any large outbreaks in quite some time. So that's some good news uh, in the insect world because this is a non-native invasive pest that uh, without that fungus can cause a lot of damage to forested areas in the state. And then the commonest ant I was seeing and getting reported this past spring is a species called the odorous house ant. And you can probably guess from the name, I've probably got some uh, story about how you can identify it with smell. Well, and you'd be correct. This is another ant you can squish in your fingers. It has a distinct odor of coconuts. Um, so this is another one you can chat with folks over the phone and identify little black ants, smells like coconuts when you squish them. They're very fond of sugar, so if you have you know, sodas out at a picnic and these things are going to sugar, that's my top guess. They also will wander indoors. Well, this past spring I had a, a distinct increase, a um, lot more than the past couple years during the really rainy period. I almost wonder if we were getting so much rain, the ants were looking for higher and drier spots and that might have forced them inwards indoors in a lot of locations. So lots of reports throughout the state of the odorous house ant during the spring months, especially uh, during the month of May. And then once we get to the month of May, 
And uh, of course, spring, then we start talking about ticks. Um, and we do definitely need to be wary of ticks in the state with things like the deer tick carrying um, uh, Lyme disease and some other diseases. And then uh, things like the wood tick being out there. And then a relative newcomer, the lone star tick, which can have some complications like ehrlichiosis and uh, allergies to red meat. My colleague Susan Pasquitz, a medical entomologist, is keeping a close eye on uh, the ticks in the state. But it seemed to be a pretty good tick year out there in Wisconsin as well. Now, also along the lines of blood-sucking uh, parasites, you know, we've got our uh, mosquitoes here, um, our official state bird, I like to joke. We actually, it turns out, have about 60 species of mosquitoes in the state alone. Um, so they vary slightly in appearance and size and some of their coloration. So if you've ever wondered why some mosquito bites welt up really bad and other ones maybe not as much, there's probably some subtle differences in their saliva that may uh, account for that. Well, if you think of the weather that we had, it was an extremely rainy spring. And so it makes sense we had very, very high numbers of mosquitoes a little bit earlier than I expected. It was more like the third week of May. Um, typically, the last few years, it's been just after Memorial Day or into early June before we got our big flush of mosquitoes. This year, they seem to be a little bit earlier because we had some nice warm temperatures. We had lots of rain. And so early on, our mosquito pressure was really quite high in the southern part of the state. They were actually a little bit slower and behind us in the northern part of the state. Some good news from the disease front, West Nile virus risk is relatively low, but that's increasing as time goes on with the season. Reason for that, it's been a little bit drier lately. And there's differences in terms of the mosquitoes that do better under really rainy conditions and very dry conditions. We're starting to see a little bit more of Culex pipiens, our northern house mosquito. That one is associated with things like West Nile, whereas our commonest one we were seeing earlier, the floodwater mosquito Aedes vexin, isn't a very good vector of West Nile. So a little bit counterintuitive. You get lots of rain, you get lots of Aedes vexins, but not as much West Nile, versus if it's drier, you actually see an increase in West Nile cases. And just to follow up, um, last year we did have our first detection of the Asian tiger mosquito, a non-native species from Asia, Aedes albopictus. This is one of the two species you'd hear on the news associated with things like Zika virus, chikungunya, dengue fever. We had our first detection last summer, um, one spot here in Dane County, one over in Waukesha area. We haven't had any reports of that one this year. We are keeping an eye on it though because that is a new non-native species in our area. And just to give you an idea of how the mosquito caseload look like, um, this blue line right here, that's 2018. So to start our season, and this is some data from our medical entomology lab run by Susan Paskowitz and, and colleagues and her students. Um, typically, in early June, our trap catches in the state um, would average about 300 or so mosquitoes. This year, we were averaging about 1,800. So again, we had a very, very um, kind of abrupt, unsettling start to the season. Things have perhaps quieted down a little bit, but it caught us a little bit off guard to have that many mosquitoes that early in the season. And then... Once mosquitoes arrive, as far as I can tell in the diagnostic lab, that's when I feel I'm in full summer mode because we saw earlier my bell curve chart really picks up in about May and June. And then this time of the year, I'm dealing with about uh, 400 cases or so a month. And so I really kind of feel like this little twirler moth right here, just kind of spinning in circles. Um, very, very busy this time of the year. But it's also fun. I get to see a lot of cool insect cases as well, um, like these blister beetles. Um, I see a few cases each year. I had a couple more than usual this year. These are pretty good sized beetles, about an inch long. There's a bunch of different species in the state. Um, they have interesting life cycles. Some of the species actually attack and parasitize the eggs of grasshoppers in the soil. There are some other ones associated with certain bees and things like that. Uh, they get their name of blister beetles though because if you were to squish one on your skin, they contain a chemical toxin called cantharidin. If you've heard of Spanish fly, that's cantharidin. If you get that on your skin, your skin will welt up with a blister-like rash. So if you ever see these, you wouldn't want to crush them on uh, a bare skin. But I typically get a few reports each year in uh, early summer. And these reports tend to come from the western part of the state. So La Crosse, Trempolo County, Eau Claire area, St. Croix County. So a lot upper uh, western part of Wisconsin. And what they do is they show up kind of out of the blue. They go to gardens and landscape plants. They tend to nibble on flowers, especially they, they like plants from the legume family. Uh, and then a week later, they're gone without a trace. So they're kind of hard and, and unpredictable to pick up on. But I had a number of reports of these um, back in uh, the month of June. 
Also in uh, June, it's a good year for rose chafers. If you live in a part of the state with sandy soil, you might encounter these. These are basically our native version of Japanese beetles. And if you're in a part of the state that doesn't have sandy soil, you've probably never heard of these things or seen them. Um, so they're very, very specific in what parts of the state they like to live in. But they cause damage almost identical to Japanese beetles, that skeletonization type damage. Um, they like to feed on many of the same plants. Uh, landscape plants like roses and some trees and fruit trees and grapes and things like that. Luckily, they're only active for about a month. So mid-June by about mid-July, they're done for the year. Unfortunately, by mid-July, Japanese beetles are out in full force. And we seem to be having a pretty good year for these. Let's look at the patterns we've seen the last couple of years, though. In 2014, it was interesting. Overall, across the state, their numbers seem to be down. Well, if you think about the winter we had just come out of, the winter 2013 to 2014 was brutally cold. I think that probably did in a lot of the larvae that were overwintering in the soil because we had frost that went down several feet. But to follow up on that, we had a couple of mild winters, so their numbers seemed to creep up in uh, 2015 and, and 2016. By 2017, I'd say across the board in the state last year, we had very, very high populations of Japanese beetles. In 2018, it seems to be a little bit more hit or miss. There are areas where we have very high reports of activity. We have some other areas where we aren't seeing as much. And one other clue I look at, um, so they do have those green and yellow Japanese beetle traps, which I generally don't recommend because they can smell the pheromones from long distances and you're kind of putting a bullseye on your yard. <laughs> They're great for research purposes though. If you want to collect a lot of Japanese beetles in a short amount of time to do experiments, they work very well in that regard. And I have some colleagues that have been doing that and, and when I used to be in a research position here at UW, I could put out a couple of traps and catch a few thousand beetles in an afternoon and they're putting some of the traps out in, in an afternoon getting a few hundred rather than a few thousand. So in some spots it's down, some spots are up, but it's really pretty variable across the board. But overall, Japanese beetles seem to be having a decent year in the state. And then another beetle pest um, that needs very little introduction, emerald ash borer, um, is really out in force, um, especially in places like Dane County in southeastern Wisconsin. We've had a lot of, of dead dying trees because of this. Just to show you the spread of this and give you a little bit of uh, background the last couple years, this map is from 2014. The red counties are quarantine counties. So these were counties where we had confirmed uh, reports of emerald ash borer. So we went from about oh, 20 or so counties to 2017, all of a sudden we were up at 40 or so counties, so really a lot of spread just in the span of about three years. Um, it got to the point where in 2018, the Department of Ag and uh, the feds quarantined the entire state. Doesn't mean that emerald ash borer is up here in the North Woods yet, but the entire state has been quarantined from a regulatory standpoint. But let's look at this map to give you some more insight into the situation. So these green areas, these are townships and municipalities in Wisconsin where emerald ash borer has been confirmed. We know Dane County has got it bad, southeastern Wisconsin. This is where we first found it in the state over here. So it makes sense. And this is a big population area, so it could have gotten moved around with firewood very easily. We also had our second detection in the state was over here, Vernon Crawford County areas. So we have a, a pretty good band of activity here. And across the river, by the way, there's a lot of emerald ash borer in Minnesota. When you look at the overall map, though, how much of Wisconsin's area actually has emerald ash borer known from it? probably somewhere in the ballpark of maybe 25 or so percent. So the point I want to make is, yes, we've got a lot of dead dying trees in this part of the state. This is going to get a lot worse before it's all done though, because look at how much area emerald ash borer hasn't gotten to yet. And when you think about the ash component um, of our forest in the state, we're estimated to have about 770 million ash trees in Wisconsin. The majority of those are up here in the North Woods, swampy areas where you get black ash and that insect is just starting to get a foothold. So this is gonna be something that plays out really over decades and decades to go. So the story is not done, even though in this part of the state it, it may kind of feel like it, um, this is gonna be playing out for years to come. 
Another invasive species I'll mention briefly in passing, um, this is a lily leaf beetle. It showed up a few years ago in 2014. Um, it's actually been in the country uh, and in eastern North America since the 1940s, just after World War II it got brought in. It feeds on true lilies. It showed up in 2014 in Wausau area in Marathon County. It's since spread up into Lincoln, down into Wood and Portage counties. In 2018, we did have a detection in Shawano County, so it's moving around that part of the state. If you think about where Highway 29 goes, you know that runs from Eau Claire over to Green Bay. Um, I would suspect that in the next few years, it's probably going to make it either to Eau Claire area or Green Bay because in terms of distance, uh, they're not that far away from that. So we're keeping an eye on that one. If you have true lilies, um, it doesn't like day lilies, but true lilies, this is something to keep an eye out for. They're bright red beetles, about a quarter of an inch long, and they cause lots of, of damage to the plants. Another very closely related beetle, but this one goes after viburnums, also showed up in the state in 2014, has almost the same pattern. North America, just after World War II, um, is hanging out in the eastern U.S. for really decades. Showed up Wisconsin in 2014. This one goes after viburnums, though. So viburnums and related plants like arrowwood, and it really clobbers them. I mean, it'll basically take out your viburnum shrubs in your yard. It causes damage similar to Japanese beetles, kind of that skeletonization type damage. Um, but this can be extremely severe. There are certain cultivars of viburnums that don't get attacked as badly, but some just get clobbered. And so for the last couple of years, we've been watching it smolder in that four corner area, Milwaukee, Waukesha, uh, Washington, and um, uh, Milwaukee there, uh, Ozaki is the other one. Uh, but in 2017, it showed up in Oshkosh, and it wasn't a recently planted shrub that someone moved up there with the insects. So how did it get there? Where else has it spread since then? This is another one that we're keeping a close eye on in the state because Dane County really isn't that far from the southeastern area. So this insect could show up. So if you have viburnums in your yard, this is an insect to keep an eye out for. A couple other curiosities I like to point out, a brief note about black widows. We do technically have native black widows in the state. They're really rare. Most Wisconsinites will go their entire life without seeing a black widow spider. Um, we do have them particularly up in uh, Door County area. Seems to be the one hot spot. In a typical year, I'll get one or two reports. 2017 was odd, though. I must have had about 15 or 20 reports. Probably due to some weather pattern, but it's hard to pin that down. If you'd like to read more, check out my website. I do have a blog post about that one that discusses the Black Widow situation in the state. We're also in that peak time of the year, maybe a little bit past peak for some of these cool insects out there like cicada killer wasps, which um, sound dangerous, but they're really not. But these are very, very large wasps, maybe about two, pushing three inches long. They look intimidating. They're solitary nesters that are really quite docile. They're pretty common in areas here on campus and lots of folks will see them in their yards or in their neighborhood. And also this summer I've had lots of reports of these um, sand wasps that have similar biologies. A little bit smaller, they might look intimidating, but they're really interested in their prey, which are things like spiders or uh, grasshoppers or katydids and things like that. And right about this time of the year is when I start getting into my peak wasp and yellow jacket season. Um, so lots of reports at the moment of paper wasps and yellow jackets and bald-faced hornets. The story with these is the entire colony dies out in the fall except for the females that will be next year's queens. So those queens go find a sheltered spot to overwinter. They hunker down, they make it through the winter, and then they have to start a nest from scratch. So when the female starts building her nest in the spring, it's a team of one. She has to do all the work. She's got to raise enough young. Eventually the workers start taking over, but the colonies build up in size into August and September. Um, and that's when they're at their peak size. That's also why they are most aggressive when it comes to foraging. These are the insects at this time of the year will show up at pop cans and beer cans during tailgating, that sort of thing. They are desperate for the food source to feed to their young. Um, because the colony's at its maximum size. So lots of reports of these coming into the diagnostic lab at the moment. And then one other quirky wasp I will mention briefly. Um, these are called grass-carrying wasps. And if you've ever cranked out your casement window and found some grass stuck up there, you've probably seen this particular wasp. So um, the female wasps tear off little bits of grass. They like to, to live in tubes or tunnels or that groove at the top of your casement windows. And um, the female wasp right there, she actually has her prey, tree crickets. So she provisions each of these cells with a tree cricket, lays an egg, and that's what her young live off of. Really pretty docile creatures, but one of these interesting things that shows up during the summer months. 
And then a few big stories going on in the state. And this one went on a couple of weeks ago. These are armyworm caterpillars. They get their name armyworm because they can occur in very large numbers and literally march across roads by the tens of thousands. And we saw that in the state. I had about two, three weeks ago, dozen or so reports of armyworms around the state of very, very large numbers where you could be a farmer and be seeing tens of thousands of these in your farm fields. Well, what can also happen, because these insects like to feed on plants from the grass family, so if they're feeding in a, a corn field or a wheat field and they eat all the crop, they start moving and they'll march across the road by the thousands and get into your home lawn and start eating your lawn. So I had lots of reports of that. Luckily, things have quieted down in about the last week and a half and they only have two generations per year up here. So we haven't had any more reports, um, but I did have lots of activity of armyworms just a few weeks ago. Along those same lines, there's an even larger caterpillar, the white line sphinx moth caterpillar. And these can push about four inches long. They've got a bunch of different color patterns, but they're typically some type of green or brownish or dark color. Um, and again, you could find these in agricultural fields, sometimes by the tens of thousands. The good news with these is they weren't really damaging the crops. In many cases, they were actually feeding on weeds within the fields. So they're actually helping the farmers out, but if you were a farmer, and you didn't know that, you'd be really nervous seeing tens of thousands of four inch long caterpillars in your field. Well, these have since pupated and are turning into the adults, which we're just starting to see, and I've been getting this trickle of reports, and I suspect many of you might have seen the adults as well. The adult is the white line sphinx moth, which has a hummingbird-like behavior, and when you see it flying, it's got the white line across the wing, and the adults are good size. They've got a wingspan of about four to five inches, uh, and they've got a very, very long tongue, so you can see why folks can mistake them for hummingbirds. They've got this long proboscis that they can stick down into flowers to sip nectar, and they're just a joy to watch. They're really cool insects to see. I've been seeing some other uh, reports of hummingbird moths recently, like Nessa sphinx moth. There's also some uh, clearwing hummingbird moths, which we can see in this little video clip here. They actually have transparent portions of their wings. You can see through it when it flies like that, but they also have hummingbird-like behavior and will be active uh, primarily during the day. Uh, another caterpillar that showed up in the state, this is my first new invasive species in Wisconsin for the year, the purple carrot seed moth. And they're teeny tiny little caterpillars, less than a half inch long. And they tend to be dark green or olive or reddish with these distinct white polka dots on the body. And they get the name of purple carrot seed moth because of their fondness for plants from the carrot family. And what we've been seeing them on are plants like dill. And here's what they do. They basically take the little clumps of the umbel or the dill flower and they tie it together with silk. Um, so it's not going to be a major pest of carrots because if you're growing carrots, we don't really care about the seeds a whole lot unless you're maybe collecting the seeds. Where we're gonna see issues with this, um, dill, coriander, and fennel. Plants from the carrot family are grown for seeds. So we haven't had any records from Dane County yet, but if you're growing dill in your garden, look for clumps of little flowers that are tied together with silk. And if you pull that apart and look for little caterpillars out there and it looks like this, that would be that new invasive species. We'd love to hear about this. It first showed up in the country in 2008, so it's relatively new. When I was trying to identify it, it wasn't even in the caterpillar guidebooks. So it took me a while of head scratching to figure out what it was. Eventually they turn into little beige, greenish, uh, grayish moths with kind of a whitish head region. So that's what they look like. We've had uh, reports from, at the moment, Kiwani, Dodge, Sheboygan, Racine, and Milwaukee County. So mostly the eastern part of the state. But again, if you grow dill in your garden and you see something that looks like this, I'd love to hear about it so we can keep track of that one in the state. And just a few more cool things to point out. It seemed to be a good year for giant silk moths, things like uh, Luna moths and Polyphemus and Cecropia moths and some of the others. I've had lots of reports of those in Wisconsin. It also anecdotally seems to be a good year for monarchs. I've seen lots just driving around. I've had lots of, of similar comments from folks out there as well. So we have lots of reports of um, the adults. We've got lots of folks finding and, and perhaps raising the caterpillars. And as you've probably heard in the news, the general uh, news about monarchs is not good. We look at some of the historical trends, and this is a graph showing the overwintering numbers. 
The last few years, they've really been pretty low. So this is a precarious position that monarchs are in. Um, there has been a group formed in the state of coalition, the uh, Wisconsin Monarch Collaborative, which is really part of a nationwide effort, especially in the Midwest, to help out the monarchs. So there's being plans developed to um, get more milkweed out there and do other things. Part of this group um, has come up with the overall plan in the Midwest for this Midwest quarter. So Wisconsin all the way down to Texas, this migration route for the monarchs. And they've basically figured that to really give the monarchs a good fighting chance, they're gonna need to add about 1.3 billion additional milkweed stems. So that's a lot of milkweed. Wisconsin's cut of that. Um, what we need to get is about 119 million milkweed stems in the state. That's our goal. So if you have any interest in planting milkweed, by all means, you know, go crazy. Put a lot of milkweed out there because the monarchs certainly do, know it, do need it. Um, with folks raising and being interested in monarchs, we've got a lot of other insects being reported because folks maybe haven't taken a close look at uh, milkweed before. Things like oleander aphids. And then one insect that's been extremely common this year, I've had lots of reports of this, the milkweed tussock moth, which also feeds on milkweed, black and white and very fuzzy in appearance. I've had lots and lots of reports of those. And just a few other creatures here before I wrap up and take any questions. Some sawfly species have had a very good year as well. Things like the elm sawfly have had a couple reports of recently. Otherwise, there's an unusual non-native species that I don't see very often. Um, it's associated with loosestrife plants. Not like purple loosestrife, but uh, are some of our native and ornamental ones. And I normally get one report a year, and this year I've probably had a dozen or more. So it's just one of those weird trends. We get a blip on the, the chart, and they may even be gone next year. With the drier temperatures lately, spider mites have been pretty good. Uh, spider mites happen to thrive under dry, hot conditions. So I've had lots of plant samples coming in with um, some spider mite activity and damage. Things like bark lice, um, we're getting into the time of the year where we see these. Um, bark lice, there's one particular species that we call tree cattle because they hang out in groups on tree trunks like this. And if you haven't seen these before, that's maybe a little bit alarming. When you look in closer, they've got a striped appearance. The adults look something like this. They're really harmless though to plants. What they do is they're nibbling on lichens and other little tiny things living on the plant bark. So they pose no threat at all to the trees, but it can be a little bit alarming and I've had a lot of reports of those recently. We're also getting into the time of the year where orb weaver spiders really take off, or I should say they're spotted most easily. So I'm starting to get a trickle of reports of these. I've seen a lot of them out there by, uh, uh, on my own with my own observations. And uh, going forward in the next month or two, we'll see a lot more of these out there. Uh, they're just cool spiders to, uh, to observe. And a lot of them, as we can see here, have very, very pretty patterns on their body. And then the last thing I'll mention, we're getting into that time of the year where I start getting a few reports of foreign grain beetles. These are teeny tiny little brownish beetles that look like this. They are associated with things like musty grain in silos. They also have a really unusual association with brand new houses. And it sounds bizarre, but here's what happens. You have your new construction. Maybe your house was built a couple months ago. There's residual moisture in the wood and other construction materials. With that moisture, you get a little bit of mold that grows, and these beetles can basically smell that. So they come flying in, then up goes the siding and the drywall. They're trapped in your wall voids. So you move into your brand new house, and all of a sudden, thousands of these little beetles start coming out, and you're thinking, I'm in a new house, I shouldn't have any insects, and you've got thousands of these insects, which can be really alarming. The good news with these is once things dry out, over the next couple of months and you get into winter especially, that wood in the construction material dries out. Any mold that was there basically goes away. They're running out of the food source. They starve to death. Um, so they'll go away on their own. You just have to communicate that to people. But it sure can be alarming if you move into a brand new house or recently renovated house and you've got lots and lots of these coming out of electrical outlet plate covers and vents and things like that. So with that said, that's my whirlwind tour of uh, insects I've been seeing coming into the state. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them as well. <laughs> and she is not related to J.I. Case. She's not even related to Justin Case. So I wanted to clarify that. Well, I thought she was a Case, but she's not a relative at all of, of J.I. Case. So. Now we know. 
and the emails are flooding in, and I appreciate everyone's time. Now, questions to PJ. Red orange. There are some I've seen that are kind of a brownish orange. Bark lice are an interesting group. Um, there's a lot of species out there and basically nobody studies them. Um, so there's one guy down in Illinois I know that studies them. Um, I suspect there probably is some type of, of orangish species native to our area or another thing that can happen is there's these non-native species that get transported into an area and they don't cause any type of problems whatsoever. So we don't really know when they got here, no one documents them. Along those lines, um, at one point, right about a year ago, I think it was last August, I had biked in to campus one morning and I'm about two blocks away. I locked up my bike and I look at my arm and I see this unusual little creature and I have files in my pocket all the time. So I catch it, I get under the microscope, and it was a new, um, our first detection of a non-native bark louse in the state. Never been seen before, but again, it's one of these things that just scavenges on weird stuff. It doesn't damage anything, so um, we didn't know about it. So they're just an obscure group that uh, we have very little documentation for in the state. I saw what looked to me like a lot of bark lice. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the, the trees right by the bridge. Okay. Um, as you walk back to the car. And I looked for them every year since and haven't seen that kind of concentration. But that okay. one year, like two years ago, masses of them. Okay. Just whole herds of them on the, okay. on the tree. Interesting. I mean, one other thing I can think of, if there's any chance they might have been an aphid, and sometimes winged aphids can look a lot like bark lice, there are some very common red aphids, the genus Eurylucon, that will show up on like prairie flowers, like golden rods and things like that. Sometimes they will wander off their plants. Okay. Okay. I'll watch for If you see them, get me some pictures or specimens. We'll figure it out. Native honeypot ants, not in Wisconsin. Um, you got to go elsewhere to find those. Is it true that there are not native earthworms in Wisconsin? Yes. Um, so basically, when the glaciers came through 10,000 years ago, it smushed and obliterated, got rid of our earthworms, it got rid of ticks, and you know just about anything else. Um, our common earthworms are essentially European species that got brought in here. For the most part, they don't seem to cause big issues, especially if it's like a home garden or a farm field. They're enriching the soil, getting oxygen in. In forested areas, there may be some detrimental impacts, but it's, you know, the, overall they probably do maybe a little bit more good than bad. The jumping worms, though, are kind of a new ball game because that one just causes a lot of damage for us. Has any research study done? to see the effect of jumping worms if you breed them a lot on an opium plant, whether it can destroy the opium plant because we are spending millions of dollars in Afghanistan mm -hmm. to give it to the farmers not to grow opium plants. Okay. Is there any way we can grow or breed these uh, jumping worms and then try to see if the opium plant dies? That's a great question. So I've never heard of or seen any research on jumping worms and opium plants. Um, I don't know if anyone would, one would be researching that at all. Uh, it would be interesting. It depends a little bit on the plant um, in terms of the type of impact it'll have on it. If they're relatively small plants, <laughs> then you can get um, flowers and shrubs dying from jumping worms. Larger plants, or if there's a big enough root system, I probably wouldn't expect it to take those out. And I don't know enough about opium plants, or, you know, poppies, to, to know about the root system and if the worms would really have enough of a detrimental impact in a case like that. How often do they find new species in Wisconsin? Like entirely new to science? Yeah. It does happen from time to time. Um, I have some colleagues, you know, working on graduate, you know, master's thesis or a dissertation, and they may discover a new species. I'd say overall, it's probably not that many. Maybe one a year, maybe one every couple of years. 
we have um, very regular instances where we have species that are new to Wisconsin. We know of them from elsewhere, and we find them you know, in the state. That happens on a regular basis, probably several times a month, I would guess, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but in terms of completely new to science, not that often, maybe uh, once every couple of years or something along those lines. Is there anything you can do to deter cluster flies? Cluster flies. So nothing you can really do to deter them. And if you think about their biology, they're parasites of earthworms. And we just, you can't go out in your yard and rid your yard of earthworms. We just don't have ways to do that. There are some things we can do to try and minimize the number that get indoors. I mean, we know they have to sneak in from outside, so um, physical methods, physically sealing things up, caulk, expanding insulation foam, and things like that. If you're sealing up nooks and crannies, especially around the soffit area, that can be helpful. Often what soffit flies do is they go to the wall and they go upwards, and then they get in through the soffit area. So um, if you can take a close look there and try and seal things up, that's one way you could go about it. Now, if you're in, say, a 100-year-old log cabin and there's nooks and crannies everywhere, you just can't use enough caulk to get everything sealed up. Uh, the other option folks would do is to, and you can either do this yourself or hire a pest control professional, they basically spray a residual insecticide in the same areas. Um, they tend to use products from the pyrethroid group, which do two things. They are a general irritant, so they have some repellent properties to them. So the flies contact it, they say, uh-uh, and they leave and go elsewhere. If they contact it long enough, it's going to kill them outright. So the thought is we repel them or kill them so they don't get in, and then you don't see them during the winter months. So that's the main strategy we use with those. Termites. Um, why is it that termites, you pointed out that they're starting to show up in mm -hmm. parts of Wisconsin, but why, why haven't termites been in the Midwest traditionally? What, what has caused them not to, to be here? I think in general it's, it's our winter weather. It's probably too cold for them because in the state we don't just find termites out in the woods where they would get the full brunt of the winter cold. They've always basically been in association with a building where you have heat from the foundation that probably gives them just enough warmth to make it through the winter. So if things change and we keep getting milder winters, maybe that'll change. I mean, the infestations that are in Wisconsin is basically someone has brought up infested wood materials from farther down south where those termites can be really common. So you bring up wood construction materials or maybe some fill that a, a contractor brought in to you know, fill in something in the yard, or uh, even materials for landscaping, railroad ties or something like that, that are on sale, but they came from Tennessee or somewhere down south. And all of a sudden you have a, a small colony in a hunk of wood like that, and over the course of several years, that smolder gets bigger and bigger, and then they get into the wood of your house. But I think it boils down to the winter temperatures. Um, they just too cold for them, at least for the time being, that we're not seeing a whole lot of spread. Um, I live about 40 miles northeast of La Crosse on a mm -hmm. farm. And my husband's a beekeeper, so we don't use chemicals on anything. So we have lots and lots of butterflies. Mm -hmm. The other day I saw a caterpillar I have never seen before, and I don't even know where to start to look. Mm -hmm. It was between two and three inches long. It was pretty big. And it was really fuzzy with a sort of pale gold fuzz. Mm -hmm. And then it had like this black like spike. That yeah. Came up off the back and then some. On the They're back. about four towards the front, yeah. probably. Let's see, yeah. American dagger moth. And they're actually, really? yes. They, they turn is... into a moth, yeah. Um, there's been two species that have a similar uh, appearance that I've been getting lots of reports of lately. I didn't include them in tonight's talk, but American dagger moth, and there's also a banded tussock moth that can look fairly similar, but you have to look at where those little black tufts of, of hair basically come out. With the American dagger moth, there's one at the very back end that helps yeah, identify that's, that one. That's, that's it. Um, are they neutral um, overall I'd say kind of neutral um, they are technically plant feeders you never really see big numbers of them it's not like you're gonna get a yeah it's not like you're gonna get a thousand and they're gonna defoliate a tree it's you find one or two here or a couple there so I've never encountered large numbers of those so just they are actually very pretty with all the, the little hairs that we technically call those seedy but a very kind of spiky spiny appearance uh, it looks like it would be kind of soft like you could pet or something but uh, actually if you were to rub them some of those hairs can cause a little bit of skin irritation 
do they like milkweed too? Because of course we it's growing all over the farm. You know, we just let it grow as much as it wants. Yeah. So I've never heard of those associated with milkweed. Um, I've heard of them with landscape, like trees and shrubs. Okay. Um, there are the fuzzy tussock moths, which you'd probably see on the milkweed, but American dagger moth, I've never heard of them going to, uh, to milkweed plants. Thank you. Are there any mosquito traps on the market that actually work? <sighs> Depends on what you want to do. You know, if you want to collect them for research, then yes. Um, if you're hoping to collect enough to you know, put a dent in your local population so you have mosquito control. There's nothing really along those lines. There are things like CO2 traps that are sold out there. If you got everyone in your neighborhood to use one of those, then maybe. But just to have one in your yard, it's probably not going to make much of an overall impact. Far corner. Have there been any uh, ways of controlling the bed bugs? Uh, bed bugs. I know they're, they're a problem in, at least in Madison and other places. Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, that reminds me, folks driving around to get here, you probably saw a lot of furniture on the curb. It's yeah. been moving day around here, so I always put out a blast on social media, inspect for bed bugs, because they can get picked up that way. In terms of, of bed bug management, um, we've got a couple of approaches. There are heat treatments. Um, most insects die about 115 to 120 degrees. They can't sweat to cool themselves off. so. Some companies will literally bring in gigantic space heaters, get the air temperature up to 130, 140, let it sit there for a couple hours and cook them out of their hiding spots. That's one way we can deal with them. There's also chemical insecticides that folks are using. Probably the, the newest, latest thing that has just hit the market, there are some workers uh, at Penn State that have developed, it's a fungus that happens to be specific to insects and it kills insects. They've developed a product that they can use, and at least in laboratory trials, it looks very promising. What happens is one bed bug contacts this uh, treatment that you'd put out. They carry some of the spores back to their hiding area, where all the other bed bugs are hanging out, and you get that transmission and movement of spores to others, and then the spores infect the insects and reproduce. And so it might be something that's got some long residual, and it's uh, essentially a you know a biological organic type option because it's not a, a traditional nerve poison insecticide like most of our other products are. So that's kind of the the newest latest uh, thing that's come out. There's been comments about the diminishment of, of the total number of insects worldwide. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, come across your radar as far as uh, the event that's actually happening and matter of concern that just the general number of insects overall just diminishing, diminishing, diminishing? Yeah. Um, I have heard a lot of comments along those lines. You know, folks that would say, you know, 40 years ago I would drive from here to the North Woods and I'd have to stop twice to squeegee my windshield off. And we're just not having to do that as much anymore. So. There's these rumblings out there that this is going on. I think the challenge is it's very hard to document and actually sh show and demonstrate that that's going on. There was that paper that I think came out of Germany within the last year, and that was really about 30 years of work to be able to document that, yes, they're going down. So I suspect it probably is going on. It's just very, very hard to kind of document and prove that. But I've heard lots of reports that, you know, Species X, Y, Z used to be a lot more common and we just don't see them anymore. And if you think about the grand scheme of things, um, what's gone on with land use changes over the last 50 or 100 years, we have a lot of habitat change with urbanization and things like that. Uh, we also have a lot of habitat fragmentation where maybe we set aside a little patch here, but it's a tiny little dot compared to what it used to be and it's not as good of a habitat in that regard. So I think there's a lot of uh, human factors that probably play into that, but it, it does seem like there are some of these declines going on. It's just hard to show them. Last week I was uh, trying to fix a two foot high stone wall. I was kind of caving out, so I stuck my shovel in the back dig, and with the first spadeful, out come all these bees. Mm -hmm. um, any idea what grows in the ground? Yeah, so they, 
they wouldn't be bees. Those would be one of our ground nesting yellow jacket species. Oh, Some sorry. like um, German yellow jacket and Eastern yellow jacket will do that. And what they do, is they're not great diggers. They have to go to a pre-existing cavity. So last year, maybe there was a chipmunk that had a burrow somewhere near there. And this spring, that queen found it and said, I'm going to set up shop. So her nest has been getting bigger and bigger in size. A lot of time, it may go unnoticed until you get too close or you stick a shovel into it, and then they're not happy with that. But it, yeah, it sounds like a case of our ground nesting yellow jackets. Okay. Thank you. Did you get stung? I got stung. <laughs> <laughs> right, right here. Like the, Ouch. Yeah, it was really great. My left ear was much warmer. <laughs> is there a, such a thing as a black ant, or if I see a black ant, is that just a carpenter ant? If it's a really large black ant, it most likely is a carpenter ant. That would be our largest dark colored uh, ant species. We do have some carpenter ants, though, that can be brownish. We do also have other ants, like some of our field ants, that can be blackish. And so if they're not that big, if maybe they're, you know, say three sixteenths of an inch long, an eighth of an inch long in black, you'd really have to get them under the microscope to know for sure if that's a carpenter ant, a field ant, or something else. If they're bigger, I mean like our queen field ants, they can be sometimes almost three quarters of an inch. So those are really obvious, but otherwise you need to get them under the microscope to know for sure what they are. Do you have any calls on uh, earwigs? Because I know about a lot, uh, maybe 10 years ago, we had all kinds of earwigs, and, but I haven't seen them. So that's an interesting comment. You know, in general, it's been really pretty quiet on the earwig front this year. Um, so earwigs thrive when we have, I mean, they need moisture. So if you have rainier conditions, they seem to do a little bit better. I don't know if because things have dried out um, this year, they're, they're just not doing as well. Um, I'm trying to think if I've seen any at all in my own yard, and I can't think of it, come to think of it. Um, I mean, one thing with the earwigs, they technically aren't native. They're originally from Europe. So when they first got into the state several decades ago, I mean, it really got your attention when they moved into an area. We do see that sometimes with the non-native species. When they first get in, I equate it kind of like a, a wildfire. There's a lot of activity at first, and after a while, it's more of a slow smolder. There might be natural enemies, parasites, predator diseases that kind of kick in eventually and then keep them in check. But... Uh, it's definitely a, a valid observation across the board. For me, it's been very quiet in terms of earwig reports in the state this year. And do they eat through your brain? They do not. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the story with earwigs, um, one thing I've heard is at one point the name might have been earwing, oh. with a G on the... If you actually were to get a, an earwig under the microscope, their wings are, are tucked up under protective cover. If you actually were to flick that wing out, it does have an ear shape, kind of rounded shape to it. Rather pretty to look at, but uh, I uh, think that's why they get their name. Yeah, are there any uh, insects or bugs in Wisconsin that are edible? I mean, this is a big thing of other people eat insects, and I was wondering if any that you would consider edible for humans. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there would be plenty of edible ones out there. Um, I mean, when you think about uh, insect-based foods that we're hearing about on the market, it tends to be things that themselves are probably pretty neutral in terms of taste. They don't have a strong taste one way or the other. Um, things like crickets and grasshoppers, um, those you could certainly eat. Um, things like uh, some of our maggots, uh, fly larvae are being raised as food sources, uh, mealworms and things like that are being used. Um, there are some out there you definitely wouldn't want to eat. You know, those blister beetles I mentioned earlier, if that causes you know, a blister-like rash on your skin, you can imagine what that's going to do um, if you were to, to eat that. Um, some other things I can think of that would be edible. Um, I think someone needs to get in the market for uh, Japanese beetles, you know, <laughs> spin it as, uh, as lawn shrimp and, and fry them up and coat them with spices and garlic. And, you know, if you, if you think about it, um, uh, shrimp are arthropods, insects are arthropods. If we go to restaurants, we pay a lot of money to eat lobsters and crab and shrimp. Um, the insect relative left the ocean, you know, 400 or so million years ago and diversified on land where the, the crabs and lobsters and shrimp stayed in the ocean. But other than that, they're pretty closely related. So. Yeah, good luck with that.
<laughs> Back to the jump worm. Do you, is, do, you, do you happen to know if the Arboretum is attempting to do anything at all with the, with the case that they have? So, uh, that's a good question. I'd have to chat with the folks out there to see what their latest research activities are. Uh, I do know they've done some work out there uh, in some other spots in the state with certain amendments to add to the soil. There are folks adding like mustard powder, which irritates them, and they, they come up to the surface. Will that work in the long run? We just don't know at this point. There's been a little bit of a glimmer of a hope with a certain type of fertilizer called early bird fertilizer. Um, from a fertilizer standpoint, it's got almost nothing in it. I forget the N, P, and K ratings, but it, it was something like a 301 or like there's you know very little plant nutrition in it, but it contains a, a tea tree extract, which has some natural soap-like compounds in it. And if you were to use that, it seems to irritate them. They come up to the surface, they may perish. Um, I've heard good reports with that. I've also heard some reports where it didn't seem to work very well. So variable results with that. Um, folks would need to work and, and figure out if they can get it to work consistently. Uh, another complication with that is it's hard to get. You can't just find it at the hardware store. It's a, really a specialty product geared specifically to golf courses. Um, so good luck finding it. It's expensive stuff. That's about the only thing um, that folks are really fiddling with that's shown uh, you know, some decent results at this point. But I'd have to chat with the Arboretum staff specifically, see what they're up to at the moment. Yes, so I mean, a couple of options. The, the first general tactic, if you're at home in the afternoon and you can knock them into soapy water. Yeah, and, and that's a problem. You can get a lot and you still get damage. It's very labor intensive, um, and in some cases it just doesn't do enough. There are some organic options. I mean, things like pyrethrins technically are organic. Those could also pose some risks to bees, though. It's a broad spectrum. It comes from a natural source, type of chrysanthemum, but it's broad spectrum activity. You also have to spray almost every other day because it breaks down very quickly. There are some things like neem oil that if you are just spraying it to, say, a rose bush, uh, something like that, or, you know, other plants, that's one option. One thing you could try, though, and this is something that would be very specific to, to beetles like Japanese beetle, it doesn't affect things like bees. Um, if you've ever heard of BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a bacterial-based pesticide. There are different strains, though. The common BT you'll find at the hardware store only kills caterpillars. There's a different strain that only kills flies. There's a newer strain that only kills beetles. And I've used it several years ago in a research trial on roses against Japanese beetles. It actually worked pretty well. Not as good as the conventional hardware store products. But it worked pretty well. The trade name, if you can find it, it's called Beetle Gone. That's the one brand out there that I know of. Um, again, it contains a strain of BT. It's Bacillus thuringius uh, gallerii. Um, that's specific to beetles. You probably have to order it online, though, because it just isn't in the garden centers that I've seen. So that's the one kind of organic option you could get out there that again, it's going to be really specific to the beetles. And it, that strain, it only goes after beetles. So it's really not going to touch bees and butterflies and things like that. One more. Is there an update on the uh, bee colony collapse uh, topic? Nothing really groundbreaking, I would say. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. We know it's kind of this multifaceted situation. You've got interactions with pesticide, land use changes, and habitat loss, and loss of just general flowers out in the landscape. Um, we have very serious Parasites like varroa mite, um, diseases, bacterial and fungal and viral and things like that. So it's a lot of these different factors interacting. Folks are making progress on it. There's a lot of research being done, but I haven't seen anything really groundbreaking that has figured out, you know, if we do this, this, and this, our problem solved. We haven't gotten to that point yet, unfortunately. All right, thank you.